In this presentation, we will focus on 1 Nephi chapters 1 through 5. So let's see what they teach us about Christ, about coming unto him and living the gospel. 1 Nephi Introduction The fullness of mine intent, wrote Nephi, is that I might persuade men to come unto God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob and be saved. That's 1 Nephi 6.4 The Book of Mormon, then, which is no greater scripture witness of the Lord Jesus Christ, begins with the powerful testimonies of Lehi and Nephi, both citizens of the troubled kingdom of Judah and contemporaries of Jeremiah. Nephi sought to show unto his readers, those of the latter days, that there is a God in heaven who manifests himself in all ages to those who diligently seek him, writing with what wisdom that comes only in retrospect. Nephi laid stress upon those matters which both soothe and satisfy the soul doctrines and events which will draw honest truth seekers to Christ and his church. In the first seven chapters, we see in the life of Nephi and his brother Sam a dramatic demonstration of sweet fruits of seeking the Lord for a personal witness and for divine direction. In stark contrast, we see in the lives of Nephi's older but rebellious brothers, Laman and Lamuel, the harvest of bitter fruits fruits which come from the trees that have been neither cultivated with faith nor nourished with the waters of the Spirit. To the former group, the Lord was merciful and gracious. To them he revealed those hidden things of eternity, which are mysteries to the world's things of the heavenly kingdom, from days of old and for ages to come, matters which bring joy, even life eternal. Lehi sought and received the visions of heaven. Nephi, Nephi desired the same. Knowing that God is no respecter of persons, Nephi had faith to attain even as his father. Thus to Nephi came a mighty revelation, a panoramic vision of earth's history, one likened to, if not identical, with those given to such seers as Enoch, the brother of Jared, Abraham, Moses, and Joseph Smith. Nephi learned, and thus we learn through his prophetic pen, of the doctrine of the condensation of the great God, of the coming of the Almighty Jehovah to earth to receive a tabernacle of clay, of the Savior's ministry to his ancient Hebrews, American Hebrews, of the formation and evil machinations of a great and abominable church, and of the impact on the Bible and of that church, of the concurrent growth of the mother of abominations and the church of the Lamb of God in the very last days, of the final fall and ultimate destruction of the mother of abominations, adamant to the attendant to the second coming and the glorious period of purity, the millennial, the millennium a day brought in by power of the Lamb and maintained for a thousand years for the righteousness of the people. That was taken from Joseph Fielding McConkie and Robert L. Mil Robert L. Millett's doctrinal commentary on the Book of Mormon. Continuing that, Nephi related selected instances from his own experiences as the Lethite colony traveled to the New World, incidents which become lessons of faith and courage. Such episodes as the final family's flight from Jerusalem, the son's return for the brass plates, a scriptural record of God's dealing with man from the creation of the ministry of Jeremiah, a record far more extensive and perfect than our Old Testament. The story of Nephi's broken bow, Nephi's lengthy discussion with his brother regarding God's intervention in the affairs of ancient Israel and rebellion during the journey on the water are among the timeless messages to all generations, evidences of the watchful care and tender concern of the Lord Almighty for those who serve him in faithfulness. We are introduced in 1 Nephi 19 to some of the prophets of the brass plates, Zenos, Zenoch, and Nahum, men who wrote with great plainness about the ministry of the Messiah and the destiny of Israel. 
These writings are Christ-centered and gospel-centered. Their message is clear and forthright. Drawing upon the writings of his prophetic predecessors, Nephi presented detailed prophecies concerning our Lord's rejection, the nature of the Savior's scourging, death, and burial, and the cataclysms at the time of the crucifixion. It is in 1 Nephi that the reader becomes aware of Nephi's love, or Isaiah and his writings. Having read Isaiah 48-49 from the brass plates, Nephi provides a peerless commentary on Nephi regarding the final gathering of Israel, that which is to be accomplished through the restoration of the gospel in the last days. The work of gathering will continue, Nephi teaches us, with an accelerated pace into the millennium, the time when the wicked are destroyed by the fires associated with the coming of the Lord in glory, and all that fight against Zion are cut off forever. Wherefore, my brother Nephi concluded his first book, I would that ye would consider that the things which have been written upon the plates of brass are true, and they as well as all those things which Nephi writes in First Nephi testify that a man must be obedient to the commandments of God. Finally, he adds, if ye shall be obedient to the commandments and endure to the end, ye shall be saved at the last day. And thus it is. Amen. A compiler of the Book of Mormon, Mormon faced difficult challenges in determining what to include in the abridged record. At least two directives guided his selection. First, the Lord told Mormon to write the things which he had been commanded. Second, Mormon saw our day and the conditions that would exist. We understand then that when Mormon made editorial decisions, these two factors were his governing concerns. The heading to 1 Nephi is the summary of the book and is part of the original text. All headings in the Book of Mormon are part of the original record given to the prophet Joseph Smith, including the inserts preceding individual chapters. For example, see Mosiah 9 and Alma 21. The brief summaries at the head of each chapter are later additions to help the reader better understand the chapter. So with that, let's start 1 Nephi chapter 1. Concerning the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith declined to tell how the Book of Mormon came forth. He stated it was not intended to tell the world all the particulars of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, and that if that it was not expedient for him to relate such things. Joseph also said, quote, I translated the Book of Mormon hieroglyphics, the knowledge of which was lost to the world, unquote. Chapter 1, verse 1, the phrase, Therefore I was taught somewhat in all the learnings of my father. This passage has evoked many discourses on the value of good parents, though it is not that to which Nephi was making reference. The use of this text for that purpose is nevertheless most appropriate. Few of life's treasures are of greater value than righteous parents. But what Nephi was explaining, however, was his ability to write somewhat not common in his day, or something not common in his day. This seems to imply that Lehi was wealthy enough so that his children could become educated. The phrase in chapter 1, having seen many afflictions, nevertheless having been my having been highly favored of the Lord, meaning, here we see the law of opposition in effect. One cannot know if one is highly favored and been blessed with the knowledge of the goodness of God unless he has also experienced affliction. In order to know good, one must know evil. In order to know joy, one must also experience pain, etc. Thus, the law of opposition is always in effect as we learn line upon line and precept upon precept. In chapter 1, the phrase, having had a great knowledge of the mysteries of God, meaning Joseph Smith stated concerning how one gains the mysteries of God, quote, 
No man can receive the Holy Ghost without receiving revelations. The Holy Ghost is a revelator. End of quote. Therefore, we can conclude that Nephi was in tune with the Holy Ghost, which enabled him to receive revelations of the mysteries of godliness. Chapter 1, verse 2, the phrase, I make a record in the language of my father, meaning this consisted of the learning of the Jews and the language of the Egyptians. Mormon gives us more detailed account of what this means in Mormon 9, 32 through 34, quote, And now, behold, we have written this record according to our knowledge in the characters which are called among us the Reformed Egyptian, being handed down and altered by us according to our manner of speech. And if our plates had been sufficiently large, we should have written in Hebrew, but the Hebrew hath been altered by us also. And if we could have written in Hebrew, behold, we would have, we would have had no imperfections in our record. But the Lord knoweth the things which we have written, and also that none other people knoweth our language. And because that none other people knoweth our language, therefore he hath prepared means for the interpretation thereof. End of Mormon's quote. First Nephi chapter 1 verse 3, the phrase, the record I make is true, meaning theologically and historically. The Book of Mormon is not feeble or myth, finding meaning like a Shakespearean play in the wisdom of lines spoken by actors of ficti fictitious characters. It is the history of an actual people, the events it records, historical realities. Chapter 1, verse 4, There came many prophets, meaning other prophets that we are aware of, that were contemporary to Lehi in this time were Jeremiah, Obadiah, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. Chapter 1, verses 5 through 15, Nephi introduces his record by recounting the manner in which the Lord called his father to prophesy to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. His doing so establishes that his father's call as a prophet was legitimate, that his authority and message can be traced directly to God. This was particularly important because false prophets were much in evidence in Judah. Moreover, the pattern of direct approach by the Lord to his prophet was so well established, virtually every prophetic book in the Old Testament opens with some such expression as the word of the Lord came to, that to any listener of that day such a declaration from a professed prophet was essential to the establishment of his credibility. Virtually, from its opening lines, the Book of Mormon commences its mission to sustain Bible truth, testify that Joseph Smith is a prophet, and prove that God was the same yesterday and forever. Consider the following. Nephi tells us that many prophets sent were sent to warn the inhabitants of Jerusalem that they must repent or their city would be destroyed, and that they should perish by the word or be carried captive into Babylon. If the Lord found it necessary to send many prophets with a, such a message, may we not assume that the prince of darkness also had many prophets to confront the, and oppose them? Such was the testimony of Jeremiah, a companion prophet, to Lehi. The nature to which Jeremiah and Lehi testify was one given up to wickedness. Zedekiah the king was weak and vacillating. False prophets abound. Temple priests were profane and adulterous. The city had become a Sodom of, and Gomorrah. Self-proclaimed prophets gave the citizens the promise of peace and encouraged them to walk after the imagination of their hearts, assuring them that they would prosper in such a course. So we see that these false prophets were just teaching what the people wanted to hear, and that they were not under sin, and such was not the case.
The Lord has various means of communicating with a prophet, but they may all be encompassed by a King James Version rendering of the expression by Jeremiah. In chapter 23, he recounts the Lord's scriptures criticism on the false prophets who, pref who preface their lies with, The Lord hath said, and the Lord's condemnation that they did not repent represent him because he had not stood in the counsels of the Lord. By whatever means they received, only that good counsel could so inform, inspire, and authorize a man as to make him a true prophet of the Lord. In that sense, of course, Jeremiah's account represents a test of a prophet for all gospel dispensations. That test is revel, 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 relevant today as when first given, for we too are del deluged with dis discordant voices crying low here and low there. We too have our profusion of prophets, just as there are those clothed in the robes of the priesthood declaring the doctrines of faith, repentance, and baptism, so there are those clothed in the academic robes who declare the doctrine of mind and reason and invite us to worship at the shrine of intellect. We have had prophets of false religion with their God devoid of body, parts, and passions who will save us by grace alone. Our hedonistic prophets with their doctrine of self-love and pleasure telling us to eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow we die. Our prophets of agnosticism and its freedom from commitment, and even our prophets of atheism and their doctrine of liberation from social restraint and moral responsibility. These and many more seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but encourage every man to walk in his own way after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world and whose substance is that of an idol, which waxeth old, and shall perish in Babylon, even Babylon the great, which shall fall. I apologize that word ear should be the word eat, for eat, drink, and be merry. The Lord's broad spectrum of available communication methods ranges from his voice coming into the mind, as with Enos, all the way to the visions and manifestations granted to seers such as Enoch Joseph, and Joseph Smith. Indeed, it seems it is the power of seership that are brought into play in many of the outstanding revelations, the scriptures recorded of which this vision of Lehi's was one. Seers and prophets, said Joseph Smith, saw the mysteries of godliness. They saw the flood before it came. They saw the stone cut out of the mountain, which filled the whole earth. They saw the Son of God come from the regions of bliss and dwell with men on earth. They saw the glory of the Lord when he showed the transfiguration of the earth on the mount. They saw truth spring out of the earth and righteousness look down from heaven in the last days before the Lord came the second time to gather his elect. End of Joseph's quote. <clears throat> this accords with Ammon's expression that a seer can know of things which are past and also of things which are to come, and by them shall six secret things be made manifest. While the record does not suggest that such glorious visual experiences are vouchsafed safe to all prophets, apparently there are given to those whose caliber, calling, and circumstances warrant it. This would particularly be the case for those heading gospel dispensations or those bringing critical messages as to pre ex, -ex, 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 -ex Exilic Israel. Clearly, Lehi was, Lehi's was such a case, and to his situation we may apply an alternate rendition of the Jeremiah statement previously referred to. As rendered in the King James Version, Jeremiah reports the Lord as asking, For who hath stood in the counsels of the Lord, and hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word and heard it?
He then gives further words of the Lord as, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsels and had called my people to hear my words, then they should have turned from their evil ways and from the evil of their doings. So and what they're saying in Jeremiah's day that the way you knew it was a true prophet is that they would prophesy and, and witness that they stood in the council in the pre-earth life, the council of the Lord as he counseled with his future prophets to come. The word counsel in the verse meaning to advise or to swarm has been replaced in more recent Bible translations by the word counsel, which has reference to a body or an assembly. The root word is the Hebrew sod, which carries with it the end idea of an intimate council or assembly. On the basis of this interpretation and several apocryphal Old Testament texts, it may be be that Jeremiah was referring to a heavenly council or assembly, his standard for the truth of salvation being that they must all trace back to the heavenly council presided over by God himself. It is noted in Amos's declaration, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the, the prophets. That's Amos 3.7. The word secret also is translation of the word sowed and carries the same meaning as the word counsel in the Jeremiah text above. Legitimate prophets must have received their mission in the pre-mortal heavenly councils. Some too appear to have had that mission reiterated and a specific commission given in a heavenly council to which they were carried in vision while they were in mortality. The matter cannot be pursued at length here, nor are the details clear. It could be that in some cases the prophet's vision upon the heavens being opened is basically a rerun of the pre-mortal call, in others a reminder or a current call. A striking example of the heavenly council experience is recorded in Isaiah 6. Here Isaiah sees God sitting upon his throne overhears the conversations of a heavenly council and learns the message they desire to be taken to the inhabitants of the, or the earth. The Lord asked, Whom shall I send, and who shall go forth for us? Isaiah, realizing why he had been included in the heavenly council, responds, Here am I, send me. A list of similar illustrations, sometimes where only the mortal participant and the Lord were present, would include Enoch, Abraham, Micah, Micaiah, Moses, Ezekiel, Joshua, Paul, and John. Clearly, Christ received his commission in the ground council in heaven. I came down from heaven, he said not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. The Son can do nothing of himself, he declared, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, there also doeth the Son likewise. We may say, then, that Nephi's introduction of this record lets us see that his father's call, like that of many other prophets, gave him both his mission and his commission in the heavenly assembly. Lehi sought the Lord in mighty prayer, and while doing so, a pillar of fire descended before him. Of this experience, we are told that he saw and heard much. Lehi then returned home, where he was overcome by the Spirit and carried away in a vision. Like Isaiah, he saw the heavens open and God seated upon his heavenly throne, surrounded by a numberless concourse of angels. Lehi was handed a book, which he was instructed to read. He read of the wickedness of Jerusalem and the manner in which it would be destroyed if its citizens did not repent. He also read of the coming of a Messiah to the people and of the redemption that would come to the world through him. The matter cannot 
Um, I'm sorry. Surely Joseph Smith found considerable consolation in this record he was translating. He too had sought the Lord in fervent prayer. He too had seen a pillar of light descending from heaven. He too both saw and heard much. As with Lehi, this expression was followed by others. He also was a visionary man. Of a subsequent experience shared with Sidney Rivian, he testified of Christ, saying, The Lord touched the eyes of our understanding, and they were opened, and the glory of the Lord shone round about. And we beheld the glory of the Son on the right hand of the Father, and received of his fullness. That is when he is receiving Doctrine and Covenants, section 76, verses 19-20. Thus, the, vision of etern the visions of eternity were opened for Joseph Smith as they were for Lehi and some of the other great prophets of all ages. The Book of Mormon, then like the Bible, rests on the testimony that the heavens have been opened, that God speaks, and that he calls prophets, endowing them with power from on high. Such was Lehi's testimony for which his neighbors sought his life. As it was with Lehi, so it was with Joseph Smith. He too testified of the contents of a book of Revelation, which caused great anger among the ungodly, who in turn sought his life. Unlike the book that Lehi read, the book given to Joseph Smith is available for all to read and prayerfully ponder. Within its covers is found that knowledge which will bring men closer to God than any other book ever published. Such is the adventure that the student of the Book of Mormon begins every time he or she opens the pages of this marvelous work and seeks the Spirit of the Lord to aid in understanding it. Chapter 1, verse 5, the phrase Lehi prayed in the Lord even with all of her, his heart, meaning in Hebrew the word for heart is levav meaning the inner man, the seat of emotion and passion, the seat of life, the soul. Lehi poured out his whole soul unto the Lord in behalf of his people, thus fulfilling the commandment of Jeremiah 29.13, quote, And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. End of Jeremiah's quote. And in accordance with modern revelation, Doctrine and Covenants 39, 18 through 19 says, quote, and, I hold, and I hold forth and design to give unto you greater riches, even a land of promise, a land flowing with milk and honey, upon which there shall be no curse when the Lord cometh. And I will give it unto you for the land of your inheritance, if ye seek it with all your hearts. End of quote. We too must learn to pray, love, worship the Lord with all our hearts if we are to obtain the blessing of exaltation. Chapter 1, verse 6, the phrase pillar of fire. The pillar of fire represents the glory of God and thus the presence of divinity. God dwells in everlasting burnings as with all who obtain a celestial glory. Joseph Smith described a similar experience as a pillar of light above the brightness of the sun. In Joseph Smith's journal, he first wrote that he saw a pillar of fire come down. It was so intense, he thought the grove was on fire. But then he later strikes the word fire out and puts light. So that's how intense and bright it was. Of Moses' initial experience on Sinai, we read, The presence of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire in the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Ezekiel introduces one of his great visions with this language, quote, I looked, and I beheld a whirlwind come out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding Un, sorry, it should be unfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof was the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. End of Ezekiel's quote. Chapter 1, verse 6, the phrase, He saw and heard much. One must be consumed with the Holy Ghost to withstand such glory. 
Moses tells us that he would have withered and died in the divine presence had he not been transfigured. Enoch described that process as being clothed upon with glory. We are told that when Christ was transfigured, his face did shine as the sun, and his remnant was white as the light. So too, then Lehi must have been overcome by the Spirit to withstand such a sacred moment, as Moses points out, quote, But now mine own eyes have beheld God, but not my natural, but my spiritual eyes, for my natural eyes could not have beheld, for I should have withered and died in his presence. But his glory was upon me, and I beheld his face, for I was transfigured before him. End of quotation. Chapter 1, verse 6, the phrase, he did quake and tremble. This experience enabled Lehi to see and hear much, which caused him to quake and tremble exceedingly. Similarly, Joseph Smith learned much in the first vision that he was forbidden to write or tell. Of his vision of the degrees of glory, he said, I could explain a hundredfold more than I ever have of the glories of the kingdoms manifested to me in the vision were I permitted, and were the people prepared to receive them. End of quote. Such trembling is not born of fear. The righteous, when brought into the presence of the Lord, experience perfect peace, which replaces all mortal concerns. Joseph Smith described the presence of the Holy Ghost as a still small voice, which whispereth through the pier through and piercing all things. He added, oft times it makes my bones to quake while it makes manifest. Chapter 1, verse 8, the phrase carried away in a vision, though he saw God sitting upon his throne. This is an experience common to the prophets and the righteous. Examples include Moses, Nephi, Paul, John the Revelator, Joseph Smith, and Christ. This is a heavenly council scene. Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon recorded a similar experience in the vision of the degrees of glory. We beheld the glory of the Son on the right hand of the Father, and received of his fullness, and saw the holy angels and them who were sanctified before his throne, worshiping God and the Lamb, who worship him forever and ever. John the Revelator describes a similar experience, thus... Quote, I looked and beheld a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and beheld a throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne, and one, and one about the throne were twenty-four, I'm sorry, were four and twenty seats, and upon the sc scar, that's a typo, and I'm not sure what the words to see. Upon the scar, I saw other, I saw our 20 elders sitting clothed in a white remnant, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And upon their, hmm, I apologize for the typo on that. Chapter 1, verse 9, the phrase, one descending out of the mist of heaven. This is obviously Christ. The brightness that attends his presence is a manifestation of his divine nature. This is similar to Joseph Smith's experience when he stated, quote, I no sooner appeared then that I found myself delivered from the enemy which held me bound. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages, whose brightness and glory defy all description, standing above me in the air. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved son. Hear him. End of quote. Chapter 1, verse 10, 12 others. These are the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Chapter 1, verses 11 through 15. This heavenly record of doom and destiny which Lehi is given to read may well be the same book as read by Ezekiel, John the Revelator, and others of the prophets. In the book given to Ezekiel, he read of lamentations and mounting and woeing, which were to come upon the ungodly. 
The revelator was shown a book sealed with seven seals, the meaning of which Christ revealed to him. John was also shown much of the earth's history down through the time of the millennial kingdom. That which Lehi read in the book dealt primarily with the destruction that was to come upon the unrepentant nation of Judah, the nation to which the Lord had called Lehi to raise a warning voice. That which he read also caused him to rejoice in the mercy and goodness of God extended to those who would turn to ways of righteousness. 1 Nephi 16-17, two sets of records. Nephi wrote his record about 30 years after Lehi's family left Jerusalem and journeyed to the promised land. The record begins with an abridgment of his father's record comprising of 1 Nephi 1-8. through Mormon's abridgment of Lehi's record was in the lost 116 manuscript pages. It was a translation from a portion of the plates called the Book of Lehi. Chapter 1 verses 19-20 Persecution had been the common lot of prophets and righteous people of all ages. Paul describes a prophet's lot as one of mocking, scourging, bonds, and imprisonments. Of the Old Testament prophets, he said, quote, They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were t- tempted, were slain with the sword, were wounded about in sheepskin and goatskin, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. End of quote. To the apostles of the old world, the Savior said, They shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. End of quote. To the Nephite people, the prophet Samuel declared, quote, If a prophet come among you and declareth unto you the word of the Lord, which testifieth of your sins and iniquities, you are angry with him, and cast him out, and seek all manner of ways to destroy him. Yea, ye will say that he is a false prophet, and that he is a sinner, and of the devil, because he testify that your deeds are evil. End of Samuel the Lamanites, quote. Lehi was mocked, and his life sought not alone because of his denouncing the wickedness of his people and his prophecy of doom for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, but also because of his prophecy of the coming of a Messiah. Many prophets, both before and after him, had been or would be killed for bearing the same testimony. Among their number, of whom we learn in the Book of Mormon, were Zenos and Abinadi. Chapter 1, verse 20. Tender mercies over all those whom he hath chosen. The lot of the Lord's chosen people was not intended to be easy. Yet the hand of the Lord is over his people, and he makes blessing of their afflictions. While Joseph Smith was in Liberty Jail, we read in Doctrine and Covenants 122.7, quote, And if thou shouldest be cast into the pit, or into the hands of murderers, and the sentence of death pass upon thee, if thou be cast into the deep, if the billowing surge conspire against thee, if fierce winds become thine enemy, if the heavens gather after thee, know thou, my son, that all these things shall give thee experience, and shall be for thy good. In chapter 1, the phrase, because of their faith, meaning it is through faith, which is doing what God wants, how he wants it done, and when he wants it done, in the Savior, that his people are able to overcome persecution and be made mighty even unto the power of deliverance. Elder David A. Bednar, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, described the tender mercies of the Lord, quote, I testify that the tender mercies of the Lord are real, and they do not occur randomly or merely by coincidence. Often the Lord's timing of his tender mercies helps us to both discern and acknowledge them. The Lord's tender mercies are the very personal and individualized blessings, strength, protection, assurance, guidance, loving kindness, consolation, support, and spiritual gifts which we receive from and because of and through the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Truly, the Lord suits his mercies according to the condition of the children of men. One of the ways whereby the Lord comes to each of us is through his abundant and tender mercies. For instance, as you and I face challenges and tests in our lives, the gift of faith and an appropriate sense of personal confidence that reaches beyond our own capacity are two examples of the tender mercies of the Lord. Repentance and forgiveness of sin and peace of conscience are examples of the tender mercies of the Lord and the persistence and the fortitude that enables us to press forward with cheerfulness through physical limitations and spiritual difficulties are examples of the tender mercies of the Lord. End of Elder Bednar's quote. Let's now go to 1 Nephi chapter 2. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. Lehi received direction to take his family and sufficient provisions and leave Jerusalem, having learned earlier of the impending destruction of the great city, he evidenced perfect obedience to the revelation dream which instructed this submissive seer to leave behind all that he had spent a lifetime in building up. Like Moses, an earlier seer who esteemed the reproach of Christ as greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, Lehi knew in what and in whom he trusted. That is the only way you can give up all your possessions and everything that you have worked for, is if you know whom you can trust, and that being the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 1, the phrase a dream. Not infrequently, the Lord makes his mind and will known to people by dreams. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, All inspired dreams are visions, but all visions are not dreams. Visions are received in hours of wakefulness or of sleep, and in some cases, then the recipient has passed into a trance. It is only when the vision occurs during sleep that it is termed a dream. When one is freed from the distractions and vicissitudes of life in sleep, then the message or impressions of an inspired dream often distill upon the soul of the recipient in an equal powerful way as a vision in the waking state. Chapter 2, verse 3, the phrase, Obedient unto the word of the Lord, servants of the Lord who do not Servants of the Lord do not obey ignorantly. Theirs is a spiritual vision. Experience has taught them the wisdom of God that he can be trusted. They have come to know that whatever God requires is right. Lehi has already had a major encounter with the Lord, and undoubtedly others preceded it. The roots of his faith were deep. To those who know not the things of the Spirit, he was a tool. To the man of God, Lehi acted wisely and well. Chapter 2, verse 4, the phrase, He left his precious things. Lehi's trust in Jehovah was complete. Having an actual knowledge that he was pursuing a path led out by the Almighty, he was now called upon to sacrifice all for the truth's sake. For a man to lay down his all, Joseph Smith said, or taught, his character and reputation, his honor and applause, his good name among all men, his houses, his lands, his brothers and his sisters, his wife and children, and even his own life also, counting all things but filth and dross for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, requires more than mere belief or supposition that he is doing the will of God, but an actual knowledge realizing that when these sufferings are ended, he will enter into eternal rest and be a partaker of the glory of God. End of Joseph Smith's quote. Such was the knowledge and faith of Lehi. Like all who are inspired to the approbation of the Lord, he was required to strip himself of the things of the Lord in order to qualify for the treasures of eternity. Well, if that is true of Lehi and all other prophets, brothers and sisters, then that means it is also true of us. We will have to be tested to see if we will strip all of ourselves of all worldly things for the sake of Jesus Christ. Are we willing to do that? 
That is a question to be pondered and answered. Chapter 2, verses 5 through 6, Lehi traveled from Jerusalem to the shores of the Red Sea. The distance from Jerusalem to the Red Sea is approximately 180 miles through hot, barren country, barren country infested anciently by many marauders. Lehi and his family traveled three days beyond this point. This meant at least a 12 to 14 day trip one way from Jerusalem to their temporary home in the valley of Lamlil. See, that's important to know when they said that they traveled for three days by the Red Sea. And then Nephi and his brothers are told to go back to get the brass plates. It's not three days. It's that three days plus the 180 miles from the Red Sea to Jerusalem. See, they were gone for about two weeks. Here's a map of possibly the trip they took. You can see the white dots that are in Jerusalem that lead down then to the Red Sea. That was 100. And 80 miles and then you can see the path they may have taken that took them eventually to the land bountiful chapter 7 2 verses 7 through 10 showing gratitude to the Lord Lehi's appreciation for the Lord's guidance and protection is demonstrated by his first act after pitching his tent he built an altar of stone and made an offering unto the Lord and gave thanks unto our God. This is the first of several instances in the Book of Mormon where faithful followers of Christ offer sacrifices and burnt offerings to express thanks to God. I've often wondered about this in the Book of Mormon, brothers and sisters. Do I make a sacrifice to show my thanks to God? And as I've pondered it, I don't think I have done that as much as I should. To give thanks and show gratitude, we must offer some type of sacrifice in some way. Let's see. Lehi followed the offering by teaching his sons the importance of staying firm and keeping the command, Lord's commandments. Sincere expressions of gratitude and obedience to Heavenly Father are necessary for all his children if they are to please him. The Lord taught, quote, and nothing doth man offend God or against none is his wrath kindled save those who confess not his hand in all things and obey not his commandments, end of quote of DNC 5921. As a prophet, Lehi held the Melchizedek priesthood and by that authority offered sacrifice. The practice and principles of sacrifice is of ancient origin and is taught to Adam by an angel of the Lord, a being who explained that sacrifice and all things were, be, were to be done in the name of the only begotten Son. Sacrificial ordinances were thus undertaken from the beginning by the authority of the Melchizedek priesthood. At the time of Moses, the Aaronic priesthood was given to administer the preparatory, preparatory gospel, the law of Moses, and under this lesser gospel, an intricate system of sacrifices was instituted. The Aaronic priesthood was the providence of the tribe of Lehi, and thus was not taken by the Nephites to America, because Nephi was not of the tribe of Levi or his family. It would appear, therefore, that the sacrifices performed by the Lehite colony were carried out under the direction of the higher priesthood, which comprehends all the duties and authorities of the lesser priesthood. So the the Nephites in the Americas did not have the Aaronic priesthood because there were no there was no one that came with them on their trip from the tribe of Lehi. I'm sorry, of Levi. Thus they did everything in the church under the authority of the Melchizedek priesthood. Elder Russell M. Russell Ballard, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, counseled us to make sure our prayers are filled with humility and thankfulness. Quote, I often hear people say, I told the Lord this, or I told the Lord that. 
be careful not to tell the Lord, be careful not to tell him, but rather to humbly seek and ask your Heavenly Father for guidance and direction. Prayer should be your yearning and filled with gratitude. End of quote. Chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, the phrase, the stiff-neckedness of Laman and Lamuel. Lehi's consummate joy of personal per participation in the divine was clouded and impe Im impeded by the constant complaints and spiritual lethargy of his elder sons, Laman and Lamuel. Like all sensitive, attentive teachers, Lehi sought to capitalize upon the elements of his surroundings to teach and exhort those under his care. The Savior himself drew upon lilies, sheep, rocks, light, and water to teach profound realities and to point men's minds towards deeper verities. <clears throat> Lehi, likewise, did Lehi take this occasion of the wilderness to show his love and to, and to solicit the support of his two will, his two strong-willed eldest sons. With reference to the river before them, which Lehi names Laman, it was as if the prophets were saying, the prophet was saying, Laman, I would to God that you would follow the path of righteousness and seek the Lord always, even as this river flows into the great Red Sea. I would with all my heart that you would pursue those paths of purity and goodness which would lead you directly into the presence of him who is the fountain of all righteousness. To Lamuel, who unfortunately offered little resistance to the whims of his older brother Lehi gave similar counsel, even as men treasure this valley as a place of refuge and life and refreshment, so may you find the same through firmly and steadfastly keeping the commandments of God. Such par parallels, like parables, fall too often upon deaf ears and do not find in the hearts of the hard-hearted. So it was with Laman and Lamuel. Regardless of the beauty or power of the preachment, the receiver must be open to the feelings and, appre and impressions associated with the present presentation of the sacred word. Otherwise, the seed is as though it were sown on sony places. Those whose hearts are set upon the things of this world, that is, their gold, their silver, and their precious things, are prone to murmur against the Lord's anointed as dreamers or visionary men. Being themselves barren trees, they deny the fruits of the Spirit to others. Chapter 2 verses 11 through 15, murmurings. One reason Satan encourages murmuring is to prevent us from following Lehi, I'm sorry, following living prophets and inspired leaders and parents. Elder H. Ross Workman of the 70 explained that, quote, murmuring consists of three steps, each leading to the next in a descending path to disobedience. First, when people murmur, they begin to question they question first in their own minds and then plant questions in the minds of others. Second, those who make those who murmur begin to rationalize and excuse themselves from doing what they have been instructed to do. Thus they make an excuse for disobedience. Their excuses are led to the third step, slothfulness in the following of the com of the commandment. I'm going to take this one, too, out of here that was put in error. The, the Lord, continuing Elder Workman's quote, The Lord has spoken against this attitude in our day. Quote, But he that doeth not anything until he is commanded and receiveth a commandment with doubtful heart and keepeth with it with slothfulness, the same is damned. 58.29 I invite you to focus on the commandment from living prophets that bother you bothers you the most. Do you question whether the commandment is applicable to you? Do you find ready excuses why you cannot now comply with the commandment? Do you feel frustrated or irritated with those who remind you of the commandment? Are you slothful in keeping it? Beware of the deception of the adversary. Beware of murmuring. End of quote. 
Chapter 2, verse 12, the phrase, they knew not the dealings of God. Those who have failed to obtain the needed witness of a particular work or doctrine involved lack the proper perspective and thus are unable to view things from a divine perspective. Conversely, those whose minds are single to the glory of God, those who seek not the things of this world, but seek to build up the kingdom of God and establish His righteousness, see things in their true light, things as they really are and things as they really will be. Murmuring and complaining simply discloses an uncommitted soul. Commitment and obedience bring understanding that cannot otherwise be had. Chapter 2, verse 13, the phrase, They sought to take away the life of my father. How was it possible that sons could seek the life of their father? What must have happened for family members to seek to overthrow the death of their own flesh and blood? Simply stated, the wicked take the truth to be hard, too hard to handle. Wickedness and corruption know no family. When iniquity abounds, the love of men waxes cold. Laman and Lamiel, like their spiritual counterparts in Jerusalem, would not receive the message, even if the messenger was their own father. Chapter 2, verse 14, the phrase, My father did speak unto them with power. It is occasionally given to the servants of the Lord to enjoy that power of the Spirit necessary to quiet and confound the rebellious and disobedient. Owing, however, to the doubting disposition of such persons, the overall impact is frequently temporary, a change of heart short-lived. Elijah's dramatic demonstration of the powerfulness of the God of the priests of Baal had but fleeting effect upon the people present. Jesus confounded the leaders of the Jews so that no man was able to answer him a word. Neither does any man from that day forth ask him any questions. Yet they remained unconvinced, unconverted, and murmur, murderous in their feelings towards the Master. Laman and Lamuel were silent on this occasion by a mighty man upon whom the prophet's mantle descended. Later, they were corrected by an angel, by the voice of God, by Nephi's demonstration of prophetic power, and by the rebellion of the elements themselves. Still, Laman and Lamuel spiritually, past feeling, turned a deaf ear to the inspired word. Chapter 2, verse 69, Nephi be exceedingly young. How frequently the Lord chooses those who are young in mortal years for his errand. Noble personalities like Enoch and Noah and David and Mary and Samuel and Joseph Smith all prepared and foreordained before the world was. These came into mortality with spiritual capacities, dispositions, and maturity which outreached those of their senior associates. God can work upon young souls and prepare them in such a manner that they, the weak things of the world, might come forth and break down the mighty and strong ones. Chapter 2, verse 16, the phrase being large in stature, Nephi's physical strength proved to be a valuable asset in his particular ministry. Chapter 2, verse 16, the phrase, great desires to know the mysteries of God. Those who are in tune with the Spirit of the Lord seek to gain the mind of the Lord and to know all that God will have them to know. Such persons delight in things of righteousness and thrill in the, in the acquisition of new truths. They hunger and thirst after righteousness. Modern revelation affirms that the opening of the mysteries of God is a joyous cause of spring's joyous results. Christ explained that unto him that keepeth my commandments, I will give the mysteries of my kingdom, and the same shall be in him a well of living water springing up into eternal life. End of quote. Further, if thou shalt ask, thou shalt receive revelation upon revelation, knowledge upon knowledge, that thou mightest know the mysteries and the preachable things, that which bringeth joy and that which bringeth eternal life. That was DNC 4261. The Lord who know 
who well knows each person's bearing capacity, wisely gives tender tutorials, timely and timeless truths, which are individually suited and intimately appropriate. In verse 16, the phrase, He did visit me and did, visit, and did soften my heart, what, meaning whether the Lord visited Nephi in person or touched his heart by the power of the Spirit is not known. The result, however, was the same. Nephi's heart was softened, and he gained a personal witness, born of the Holy Ghost, that the testimony of his father was genuine and true. With this anchor to his soul, Nephi was able to serve as a knowledgeable and com competent co-witness and testator with Lehi, and was also able to bear up under the trying and demanding rigors of the journey ahead. It is infinitely easier to handle the how when we know the why. Nephi and those like him should never be labeled as blindly obedient. Nephi was obedient with his whys temporally and spiritually wide open. Verse 16, the phrase, I did believe, meaning how could a believing heart become more believing? The soul of faith becomes richer and more fertile with each spiritual experience, the harvest of its fruits more plentiful. This verse gives us a key to understanding some of the differences between Nephi and his two older brothers. Nephi sought the Lord early and earnestly and found him. Laman and Lamuel would not so much as begin the spiritual odyssey. Nephi, Nephi could view things, good and bad blessings and trials, from an elevated perspective. Laman and Lamuel continued to refuse the vantage point of higher ground. Chapter seven, chapter two, verse seven. Sam, the phrase "Sam believed my words." This verse is a good example of Doctrine and Covenants forty six thirteen to fourteen, that speaks of two of the gifts of the Spirit. Quote. To some it is given by the Holy Ghost to know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he was carried, crucified for the sins of the world. To others it is given to believe on their words that they also might have eternal life if they continue faithful. End of quote. Sam had the spiritual gift to believe on the words of his brother Nephi and his father Lehi. Chapter 2, verse 18, the phrase grieved because of the hardness of their hearts. There was no spite or self-righteousness in, in Nephi, no stri striking back, no attempts to dominate his brothers. Rather, Nephi mourned over his brother's waywardness just as Lehi did. He pleaded with the heavens in their behalf, constantly hoping for a softening of their hearts. Chapter 2, verses 19 through 24. The word of the Lord came to Nephi, and the younger prophet received valuable counsel. Nephi learned that the Lord delights in prospering those who keep his commandments, for he that is righteous is favored of God. Further, the Lord here explained his intentions, intentions to direct the travelers of the Lehites to a promised land. As Moroni taught a millennium later, quote, and now we can behold the decrees of God concerning this land, the Americas, that it is a land of promise, and whatsoever nation shall possess it shall serve God, or they shall be swept off. Often the fullness of his wrath shall come upon them, and the fill, fullness of his wrath shall come upon them when they are ripened in iniquity. End of his quote. Moroni further testified that the Americas are a choice land, and whatsoever nation shall possess it shall be free from bondage and from captivity and from all other nations under heaven if they will but serve, God, the, serve the God of the land, who is Jesus Christ. That's why we are seeing so many calamities and destructions and murders and killings, brothers and sisters, because we have not kept the covenant of serving God, who is Jesus Christ, in this land. Therefore, we are losing, little by little, his protection. 
Chapter 2, verse 20, the phrase, keep the commandments and prosper. Elder Russell M. Nelson, the quorum of the Twelve Apostles, observed that the scriptures promised 34 times that people will prosper in the land only if they obey the commandments of God. End of quote. In the scriptures, the meaning of the word prosperity may also have other meanings not restricted to financial benefits. Further, prospering doesn't mean that life will be free from trials. Lehi and his fam faithful family members kept the commandments, but they still suffered many afflictions. President Joseph F. Smith taught that a person who keeps the commandments will be sustained and prospered by the Lord. Quote, the man who stays with the kingdom of God, the man who is true to this people, the man who keeps himself pure and unspotted from the world, is the man that God will accept, that God will uphold, that he will sustain, and that will prosper in the land, whether he be in the enjoyment of his liberty or be confined in prison cells, it makes no difference whether he is, he will come out all right. End of quote. Chapter 2, verse 21, the phrase, cut off from the presence of the Lord. To be cut off from the presence of the Lord is to be cut off from the influence of the Spirit of the Lord, to be denied access to things of righteousness, to experience spiritual death. This would also mean being cut off from the priesthood and the authority and powers of the priesthood. Chapter 2, verse 22, the phrase, a ruler and a teacher. God calls his obedient servants to rule and teach. The humble follower is called to lead. The teachable is called to teach. 20, chapter 2, verse 23, there was a sore curse that will be talked about when we get to 2 Nephi 5.21. Chapter 2, verse 24, the phrase, They shall be scourged unto thy seed. They shall be a scourge unto thy seed, meaning the Lamanites were a constant reminder, an ever-present object lesson to the Nephites on the importance of obedience and uprightness. The Lamanites demonstrated clearly the depths to which a nation could sink through spiritual rebellion. In addition, very, in addition, very frequently, Lamanite successes in battle would come to evidence a creeping complacency or eroding spirituality among the Nephites. Let's now go to 1 Nephi chapter 3. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, the phrase, Go to the house of Israel. Lehi and his family were more than three days' journey from Jerusalem. The Lord commanded Lehi again an inspired dream to have, I'm sorry, this is go to the house of Laban, not to the house of Israel, to have his sons return to Jerusalem to obtain the plates of brass from Laban. It appears that Laban was a relative of Lehi's, at least he was of the same lineage, and may have been the member of the family responsible for keeping the genealogical records. Chapter 3, verse 2, the phrase, dreamed a dream. In Hebrew, there is not an equivalent to the English phrase, I had a dream. Therefore, the verb and the noun are used together. This is also seen in Genesis 37, 5, where it says, and Joseph dreamed a dream. With Joseph Smith having barely a third grade education, it would be impossible for him to know the structure and syntax of the Hebrew language. Joseph would have written, I had a dream, not that I dreamed a dream. This is a little evidence that this was written by those who knew Hebrew, and this was not written by Joseph Smith. He is only translating. Chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, the brothers, brothers murmur. Like so many of the people of the world, Laman and Lamuel viewed Lehi's request, the Lord's command, as inconvenient and unnecessary. Those blinded by selfishness and overly influenced by the cares of temporal world find the doings of God to be strange and incomprehensible. Those with spiritual vision, like Nephi, are anxious to please the Lord and are eager to know the mind and will of him who knows the end from the beginning. Chapter 3, 7, I will go. Verse 7 is one of the most cited and quoted verses in all of Holy Writ, set forth clearly the attitude of those who trust implicitly in the purposes of God. 
Though the means for accomplishing specific objectives are not always apparent, the obedient, acting upon the peaceful assurance born of the Spirit, move forward in quiet but deliberate ways, knowing full will that further light and knowledge will be forthcoming. And thus we see, later Nephi observed, that the commandments of God must be fulfilled. And if it so be that the children of men keep the commandments of God, he doth nourish them and strengthen them and provides means whereby they can accomplish the things which he has commanded them. So some of the afflictions and trials and all the things we go through, brothers and sisters, God will provide a way for us to keep those things which he has commanded. He will help provide us a way to get through them. Commenting on 1 Nephi chapter 3, verse 7, Russell, Ella Russell M. Nelson taught, I have learned not to put question marks, but to use exclamation points when calls are issued through inspired channels of priesthood government. End of quote. Elder Donald L. Staley of the 70 quoted President Ezra Taft Benson in order to teach about the power that comes through obedience. Quote, Regardless of our age and stage in life, daily obedience to gospel principles is the only sure way to eternal happiness. President Ezra Taft Benson put it most poignantly when he said, When obedience ceases to be an irritant, and becomes our quest, in that moment, God will endow us with his power. End of quote. So if we always see his commandments and things he asks us as an irritant, we will never get the power to overcome and fulfill them, brothers and sisters. But once we see obedience as a quest and a commandment from God, then he will provide us with power. President Henry B. Iron of the First Presidency acknowledged the need for prayer and faith to obey the Lord's commandments. Quote, Whosoever we are, however difficult our circumstances, we can know that, we, that, what our Father com that what our Father commands we do to qualify for the blessings of eternal life will not be beyond us. We must have to pray with faith and to know what we are to do, and we must pray with a determination to obey, but we can know what to do and be sure that the way has been prepared for us by the Lord. End of quote. Chapter 3, verses 9 through 31, the sons of Lehi sought to the best of their abilities to obtain the brass, the brass treasure. After they cast lots, Laman went and sought to reason with Laban in hopes that the later would grant and request the request of the family and comply with the will of the Almighty. He did not. Then recognizing Laban's attraction to monetary things, the brothers agreed to return to their home and retrieve many of their precious possessions in the hope of purchasing the records. This attempt also failed and the morale of the wayward ones, Laman and Lamiel, waned quickly. Chapter 3, verse 15, the phrase, As the Lord liveth and as we liveth. We are here introduced to the oath, one of the most sacred and solemn manners in antiquity. The oath was an attestation of the truthfulness and veracity of one's word or of an action in question. From the beginning, it was socially and culturally inappropriate to break an oath. The Book of Mormon records an instance of even wicked and bloodthirsty persons refusing to enter into an oath that they knew that they would break thereafter break. From the earliest ages, God has chosen to enter into covenant with man to dramatize the reality of what would appear to be incompre incomprehensible blessings. For example, God swore with an oath to all who received the Melchizedek priesthood that the promised rewards will, will be forthcoming based upon individual righteousness. Oaths can also be abused, and not infrequently persons entered into secret oaths to perpetuate wickedness. Cain entered into an oath with Satan that he would not reveal the great secret that one may murder and profit therefrom. The Gadian, 
Gadiat and bands of the later Nephite history operated by oaths and secret ceremonies and thus pet perpetuated those practices established in the earliest ages of Cain and Satan. When the Savior ministered mortality, he called for a higher righteousness, making have a righteousness. Mankind having abused the oath, the Lord specifically challenged men to let their word be their bond. If a man say, let him mean yes, if he says no, let him mean no. Oaths should not be necessary in a Christian society, for honesty and integrity should be the order of the day. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained concerning this specific passage, the manner of swearing with an oath in ancient days was far more significant than many of us have realized. For instance, Nephi and his brothers were seeking to obtain the brass plates from Laban. Their lives were in peril, yet Nephi swore this oath. As the Lord liveth, and as we live, we will not go down unto our father into the wilderness until we have accomplished the thing which the Lord hath commanded us. Thus Nephi made God his partner. If he failed to get the place, it meant God had failed. And because God does not fail, it was incumbent upon Nephi to go to to go the to the plates to go get the plates or lay down his life in contempt. I'm sorry for that. Um, for, to go get the plates. Or lay down his life in the attempt. Chapter 3, verse 19, the phrase, It is wisdom in God that we should obtain these records. The Book of Mormon contained a powerful testimony of the importance of scriptural records for, for the spiritual and intellectual preservation of a nation. The brass plates enabled the Nephites not only to know of and remember the spiritual legacy of ancient Israel, but also to have the perpetual, to have and perpetuate the language of their fathers. Later in the Nephite record, we learn of the sad tale of the Mulekites, who squandered their responsibilities for a time because of their spiritual and intellectual illiteracy, a condition due largely to the lack of a written record. Chapter 3, verse 20, the phrase, The words which have been spoken since the world began. The brass plates contain an ancient account of the world's prophets and seers from the time of the creation to the time of Lehi and Jeremiah, or in other words, from about 400 B.C. to 600 B.C. It was a more extensive and complete record of God's dealing with his children than our present Bible. It appears to be primarily a record kept by those who descended from Joseph and also recorded of prophets of the tribe of Joseph. This verse attests that all the holy prophets have testified of sacred truths common to all generations. Chapter 3, in that last paragraph, that might be an also a record of prophets of the tribe. Oh no, prophets of the tribe of Judah. It's the, the kings came from the tribe of Joseph. So we're correct. Chapter 3, verse 29, an angel of the Lord came and stood before them. Nephi indicated earlier that he would seek to make it clear to the reader that the tender mercies of the Lord are over all those whom the Lord hath chosen because of their faith to make them mighty even to the power of deliverance. Here was an occasion when Laman and Lamiel sought to do bodily harm to their younger brother, and on occasion when the Lord delivered his servants in a miraculous manner, thus verifying the words of the prophet Nephi. I will go before your face, the Savior explained to a group of his Latter-day Saints. I will be on your right hand and on your left, and my spirit shall be in your hearts, and my angels round about you to bear you up. Doctrine and Covenants 63, 9-12 tells us why this sign of an angel coming to them did not have any converting power over Laman and Lamiel. It states, this is section 63. But behold, faith cometh not by signs, but signs follow those that believe. In other words, God gives signs to those who already believe to strengthen their faith. God does not give signs 
to get faith. It's for those who already have it. This is why it never helped Laman and Lamiel, because they didn't have faith in the first place. Yea, signs come by faith, not by the will of men, nor are, nor as they please, but by the will of God. Yea, signs come by faith unto mighty works, for without faith no man pleaseth God. And with whom God is angry, he is not well pleased. Wherefore unto such he soweth no signs, only in wrath unto their condemnation. Wherefore I, the Lord, am not well pleased with those among you who have sought for signs and wonders for faith and not for good and men unto glory. Thus the angel coming down telling Lim and Lingle to stop beating Sam and Nephi with the rod does not convert them because they did not have the the faith in the first place. Chapter 3, verse 31, Laman and Laman began to again began to murmur. One wonders what it would take to persuade these rebellious souls to bring themselves into line with the Lord, into with the word of the Lord. In this case, the angel had barely left, having been stern and straightforward counsel, when immediately the record indicates that Laman and Laman began again to murmur and to doubt their abilities to obtain the brass plates. These verses dramatize the principle that something as remarkable as the rending of the veil and the appearance of angels has little, if any, lasting influence upon hard-hearted, upon hardened souls, souls which are not attuned to the infinite. President Joseph Filling Smith has taught that, quote, a visitation of angels would not leave the impression that we have received through a manifestation of the Holy Ghost. Personal visitations might become dim as time goes on. Now Laman and Lamiel's rationalizations on a later date. But this guidance of the Holy Ghost is renewed and continued day after day, year after year, if we live to be worthy of it. End of quote. In verse 31, the phrase, how is it possible, meaning Laman and Lamiel were faithless. They were totally unable and unwilling to trust the word of God to have confidence in things which were faithful, which faithful persons hope for but cannot immediately see. First, now look at, let's go to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1, The Lord is mightier than all the earth. Those who are on the Lord's errand need never entertain serious doubt as to how the Almighty will bring to pass His purposes. His will shall be done, whether through quiet and unnoticed means, or through a visible display of the works and words of God of creation. Our God is a God of power, and those who represent Him in righteousness are given, contingent upon the will of the Omnipotent One, power by faith to break mountains, to divide the seas, to dry up waters, to turn them out of their course, to put at defiance the army of nations, to divide the earth, to break every band, and to stand in the presence of God. Elisha, the man of God, entered a timeless truth when he sought to claim the fears, to calm the fears of his young servant. This youth recognized an almost numberless host of Syrian troops at their doorstep and sensed the nearness of death. Fear not, said Elisha, said, for they that be with us are more that be with them. The account continues, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes, that he may see. And the Lord opened his eyes of the younger man, and he saw and beheld. The mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. With divine assurance, one is always in the majority. Chapter 4, verses 2 through 3, the phrase, Let us be strong, likened to Moses. In a day when theologians of the world have demythologized and, de and metaphor metaphorized unto meaninglessness many of the events of the Old and New Testament, it is refreshing to turn to an additional scripture witness to find testimony of the reality of the miraculous among the sons and daughters of God in, antiqu in, in antiquity. As discussed in the introductory marks of this volume, 
One of the stated purposes of Book of Mormon is to prove to the world that the Holy Scriptures are true and that God does call and inspire and empower his servants in all ages of the earth's history. The Book of Mormon is an additional witness of the actuality of Moses and of the remarkable events surrounding the delivery of the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. Chapter 4, verse 6, the phrase, led by the Spirit of the Lord, not knowing beforehand. The angel had recently explained to the sons of Lehi, Behold, you shall go up to Jerusalem again, and the Lord will deliver labor into your hands. Acting upon this imperative, Nephi made his way into the dark streets of Jerusalem, trusting his well-being to the Lord to whom he had sent him. Nephi was directed not by an angel, but rather by the quiet and gift, certain gift of the Holy Ghost, the feeling and impression and voice for which he had sought for, and for which he was now qualified and entitled because of his faithfulness. Nephi was one who had treasured up continually the words of eternal life, and now in the very hour of need, the divine direction was to be forthcoming. L. John H. Goldberger, of the 70 Challenges, quote, Be willing to take responsible risk. We live in an age of reason, logic, facts, and figures. These can be useful if kept in subjection to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But if they ever take precedence over faith in him, then they are not useful and can be very harmful. I have found in my life that most of the good decisions I have made may not have been made if they were based solely on logic or reason. Nephi was determined to do what God warned him to do, even with logic to the contrary. The scriptures tell us in 1 Nephi 4, 6 that he went forth not knowing beforehand what he should do, but knowing he should obey God and get the plates. I suspect he he had listened only to reason. I suspect had he listened only to reason, Nephi and his brethren would still be waiting outside the walls of Jerusalem. I sometimes wonder if by our listening to reason and logic too much and not trusting God enough, we may find ourselves waiting outside the walls of his holy city. End of quote. Chapter 4, verse 17 through 18. The Lord had a mission in mind for Nephi and for the destiny of the Nephites, and he would not allow a greedy and worldly man to interfere with the accomplishment of his purposes. To Nephi's utter horror, he was commanded to put Laban to death, to send a wayward man to the spirit world to account for his deeds. At first, the idea of killing a man was abhorrent to his sensitive soul, but the Spirit provided a rational explanation for the divine directive. In particular, it brought to Nephi's remembrance the fact that one brought to the brought brought to Nephi's remembrance the fact that Laban one had sought to kill Nephi and his brethren, and two had not been obedient to the commandments of the Lord and three had confiscated their gold and silver and precious things. The Spirit assured Nephi that the present fortuitous circumstances, finding Laban drunken and incapacitated in the streets, was not an accident, but that the Lord hath delivered him into thy hands, according to the law of retribution. Nephi was perfectly justified in slaying Laban, in a revelation given through the prophet Joseph Smith in August of 1833, the Lord explained the circumstances wherein the saints were justified in standing up and striking back at their enemies. He said, he then said, quote, Behold, this is the law I gave unto my servant Nephi, and thy fathers Joseph and Jacob and Isaac and Abraham, and all mine ancient apostles. So the law of retribution was a law of God, and Nephi was just following the law of God. In general, Nephi justified and slain Laban without rational explanation because God had commanded it. That which is wrong under one circumstance, Joseph Smith explained in 1842, may be and often is right under another. God said, Thou shalt not kill. At other times he said, Thou shalt utterly destroy. 
This is the principle on which the government of heaven is conducted, by revelation adapted to the circumstances in which the children of the kingdom of in the kingdom are placed. Whatever God requires is right, no matter what it is, although we may not see the reason thereof till long after the events transpire. End of Joseph Smith's quote. Why could God tell Nephi to kill Laban and still be a just God? Well, we learn this from Deuteronomy 19, verses 6 through 19, concerning the law of bearing false witness. In my 35 years of teaching for Seminary and Institute, I have come across many who have been perplexed over the story of Nephi being asked by God to kill Laban. We know that God is a just God, and what seems to be an indiscriminately killing of Laban, even if it is better to let one man die than a whole nation perish, can be bothersome. We know that at the time of the Nephite and Laban story, Israel lived by the law of Moses, which was not only included religious laws, but civil laws too. In Deuteronomy 19, 6-19 is the civil law of bearing false witness and the consequences. It states, verse 16, If a false witness rises against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, verse 17, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days. Verse 18, And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness, and hath testified falsely against his brother, verse 19, then shall ye do unto him as he had sought to have done unto his brother, so that thou put the evil away from among you. So if one bore false witness, whatever he was going to do to that person he bore false witness against is, is the punishment he deserved. Let's now apply this to Nephi and Laban. If you read 1 Nephi 3, 12-13 carefully, you will see that Laban breaks the law and receives the punishment required by the law that you shall that you shall ye do unto him as he thought to have done unto his brother. Laban accused Laman of being a robber when Laman asked Laban for the plates of brass, and Laban then proclaims he will slay him, at which point Laman flees. So Laban falsely accuses Laman of being robber. Laman never brings that up. He just asks permission to get the plates. He never says he's going to rob them. And so Laban is bearing a false witness. And what he was going to do to Laman, that he was buying false witness was, was to kill him. Laman never once intimates that he is going to rob Laban, only that he desired of Laban the records which were engraven upon the plates of brass. Thus Laban is guilty of bearing false witness under the law. Since Jehovah is the Lord, a priest, and a judge, he fulfills those roles mentioned in verse 17 of Deuteronomy 19. Moreover, since Jehovah has power over all things, both men are before the Lord. For God to be just, then he must keep and uphold the law that he gave. Thus Laban is convicted of bearing false witness by the Lord, and the punishment is to receive what he was going to do to Laman, that is, slay him. Laban brought his death upon himself by breaking the law of God, that means the law of bearing false witness, which laws Laban would have been taught being of the house of Israel. To claim that Laban might have been ignorant of the law will not do either since all who enter the covenant are responsible and accountable for their actions under the covenant. Also, it should be remembered that the Lord gave Laban at least two chances to part with the brass plates without requiring his life. Laban was a liar, a robber, and he had at least twice sought to murder. Stealing and attempted murder could both be punishable by death. You can see that in Exodus 21.14 and 22.2 and Deuteronomy 24.7. 
The Lord wanted Lehi and his descendants to have the scripture, scriptural record, even if one man should perish, for it to happen. And that perishing was done by law. It was lawful. The brass plates blessed not only the Nephites and Mulekite nations, but they led to some of the writing portions of the gold plates as well, such as Isaiah quotations and the allegory of Zenos. The Book of Mormon has blessed and will bless the lives of millions of people and nations. Ultimately, all this was at stake when Nephi stood over Laban and followed the voice of the Spirit. Some people have incorrectly felt that the Spirit of the Lord has prompted them to do something contrary to what the Lord has command, already commanded, such as is the case with Nephi. Today, we need not worry that the Lord might prompt us to do something that runs contrary to current commandment. President Harry B. Lee has taught us who the Lord would give such prompting to. Quote, when there is to be anything different from what the Lord has told us already, he will reveal it to his prophets and no one else. So there will never be a situation like Nephi and Laban that will come up on just a normal member of the church. Those kinds of things will only be revealed to the prophet of the church. Chapter 4, verse 20, in the voice of Laban, was this another example of divine intervention? Did the Lord change, either change Nephite's voice or cause his voice to sound to Zoram's ears like that of his former master? I would say probably so. Chapter 4, verse 22, the elders of the Jews. The elders of the Jews were undoubted leave the leading citizens of the community, the wise men of the synagogue or local church. The head of several influential families may have formed a body which served in an advisory capacity to the king in civil and religious matters. Chapter 4, verse 26, the phrase, the brethren of the church. Was there a church anciently? Elder Bruce R. McConkie asked, and if so, how was it organized and regulated? He answered, there was not so much as the twinkling of an eye during the whole of so-called pre-Christian era when the church of Jesus Christ was not upon the earth, organized basically in the same way it is now. Melchizedek belonged to the church. Laban was a member. So also was Lehi long before he left Jerusalem. Chapter 4, verses 30 through 37, The Integrity of One's Word. As we draw to the close of this episode, we are again faced with the power of the ancient oath. When Zorm realized that he was with Nephi and not with his master Laban, he began to tremble and was about to flee. His fear ceased, however, when Nephi promised the servant that he would not be harmed and that he could be a free man if he went into the wilderness with Lehi's sons. When Zorm returned an oath that he would stay with Nephi and his brother, their fears did cease concerning him. Both Zorm and Nephi illustrated the potential power of a person's integrity. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles observed the need for integrity as a foundation for spiritual strength. Quote, the bedrock of character is integrity. Worthy character will strengthen your capacity to respond obediently to the direction of the Spirit. Righteous character is what you are becoming. It is more important than what you own, what you have learned, or what your goals you have accomplished. It allows you to be trusted. Righteous character provides the foundation of spiritual strength. It enables you in times of trial and testing to make difficult, extremely important, correct this important decisions correctly, even when they seem overpowering, end of quote. So this is why Laman and Lamiel had no integrity. They did not trust in the Lord. They did not have righteous character. Chapter 3, 4, verse 33, Oath-Making. The Book of Mormon contains a number of instances where oaths were taken. Oath-Making oath was taken very seriously in Nephi's day and culture. 
The principle on which an oath is held to be binding is instantly laid down in Hebrews 6.16 as an ultimate appeal to divine authority to ratify an assertion. There the Almighty is represented as promising or denouncing with an oath, that is, doing so in the most pos positive and solemn manner. On the same principle, that oath has always been held most binding, which appealed to the highest authority, both as regards individuals and communities. As a consequence of this principle, appeals to God's name on the one hand and to he and deities on the other are treated in Scripture as tests of allegiance. One scholar explained the power of oath-making in ancient times. Quote, what astonishes the Western reader is the miraculous effect of Nephi's oath on Zoram, who upon hearing a few conventional words promptly becomes tractable, while as for the brothers, as soon as Zoram made an oath unto us that he would tarry with us from that time forth, our seers did cease concerning him. The reaction of both parties makes sense when one realizes that the oath is the one thing that is most sacred and invaluable among the desert people and their descendants. Hardly will an Arab break his oath, even if his life is in jeopardy, for there is nothing stronger, nothing more sacred than the oath among the nomads and even the city Arabs, if it be ex extracted under special conditions. The taking of an oath is the holy thing with the Bedouins, says one authority. Woe to him who swears falsely. His social standing will be damaged and his reputation ruined. No one will receive his testimony, and he must also pay a money, a money fine. But not every oath will do. To be most binding, the solemn of oaths should be done by the life of someone, even if it be but a blade of grass. The only oath more awful than that by the life of the life, or less commonly, by the life of my head, is the wa hayat Allah, by the life of God, or as the Lord liveth, the exact Arab equivalent to the ancient Hebrew Hai Elohim. Today it is glibly employed by city riffraff, but anciently it was an awful thing, as it still is among the desert people. I confirmed my ma answer in the Bedouin wise, says Charles M. Doherty, by his life, he said, will swear by the life of Ola, that meaning God. I answered, and thus even the nomads use in a greater occasion, but they say by the life of three in a little matter. Among both Arabs and Jews, says Samuel Rosenblatt, an oath without God's name is not an oath. Why, both in Jewish and Mohammedan society, oaths by the life of God are frequent. So we see that the only way that Nephi could possibly have placed pacified the struggling Zoram in an instant was to utter the same oath, that no man would dream of breaking the most solemn of oaths to the Semite, as the Lord liveth and as I liveth. Now to our last chapter, chapter 5. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. When Nephi and his brothers returned to their father's camp, there was much joy and rejoicing. Exactly how much time had transpired since their departure, we are unable to tell, but it is not unlikely that they had been gone for a period of from several days to perhaps weeks. Even Sariah had been affected adversely by what seemed to be an inordinately delay in the son's return. Her fears had caused her to doubt the genuineness of her husband's revelations. When the party returned, doubt and fear were replaced with gratitude, deepened faith and commitment, and further resolve. Even a prophet's wife has to gain her own testimony. She doesn't automatically get one just because her husband's a prophet. Chapter 5, verse 10, the phrase, He did search them from the beginning. Like all those Lehi, like all those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, knew the value of searching the scriptures, of feasting upon the word of Christ, and of drinking deeply from that heavenly drought from whence pure and living waters flow. It is one thing to read the scriptures. This is commendable and indeed a profitable exercise. However, it is quite another to search them, 
to search and look for the true meanings of the passages contained therein, to delve and inquire and ponder upon the particular verses and events under consideration, and to search that spirit of truth for mastery and understanding, for wisdom is being able to liken the scriptural insights into oneself, unto oneself. Chapter 5, verse 11, they did contain the five books of Moses. As we have already noticed, the Book of Mormon helps to establish the truthfulness of the Bible. Here and in numerous other places, we have affirmed the validity of theological matters which have been questioned for centuries by those who choose to cast doubt upon the orange origins of Judeo-Christian scriptural records. The Book of Mormon is a royal confirming testimony that Moses was the man chosen by God to write the story of the creation and to compile the records which re recount the birth and development of the house of Israel. The five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, are not only sublimely beautiful pieces of ancient literature, but also divinely inspired documents which bear the imprint of God and his noble lawgiver. Elder Bruce R. McConkie has written, quote, The only biblical account of the creation was revealed directly to Moses. But we are left to suppose that he copied or condensed the historical portions of Genesis from the writings of Noah, Melchizedek, Abraham, and the patriarchs. Continuing, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are written by or under the direction of Moses. Prophets and inspired poets and historians wrote the balance of the Old Testament. End of quote. But what interests us more than the books included are the brass plates is the tone and tenor and general approach up to the gospels and to salvation that they set forth they are gospel oriented and speak of christ and various christian concepts which the world falsely assumes to have originated with jesus and the early apostles chapter 5 verse 11 the phrase and account of the creation of the world meaning the brass plates contained a more extensive account of the creation than that which is available in our present biblical record. We suppose the account was similar to that which we now have received through the prophet Joseph Smith's inspired translation of the early chapters of Genesis, which we now call the Book of Moses. Chapter 511, the phrase, an account of Abraham and Eve. The account of the creation and the placement of life on earth, as well as the subsequent fall from paradisiacal and Edenic glory, is given in our present biblical record, with little detail and even less context. Very frequently, the Bible will tell us what happened, while the more thorough and complete account, as given in the Joseph Smith translation, or as taught on the brass plates, will tell us additionally why it happened. After arriving in the Promised Land, Lehi gave a marvelous discourse to his son Jacob based upon those things which he had read on the brass plates, matters which received serious and detailed attention, where, where Lucifer's fall from heaven, the temptation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the importance and necessity of the fall of our first parents as means to the perpetuation of the human family, the value of an extended period of probation in the early days of the earth's temporal continuance and the essential tie between the creation, the fall, and the atonement. Chapter 5, verse 13, The Prophecies of the Holy Prophets The prophetic testimonies on the brass plates would have been similar to those of our Old Testament during the same time period, but again, much more extensive and complete. The brass plates contain, for example, prophecies of Abraham concerning the coming of Jesus Christ, prophecies of Jacob concerning the Nephite branch of his descendants, and prophecies of Joseph concerning Moses and Joseph Smith. In addition, we become aware through the Book of Mormon of such noble but little-known prophetic figures as Zenos, Zenoch, and Nahum. Chapter 5, verse 14, the phrase, He was the son of Joseph. Lehi was heir to the blessings of the birthright through Joseph's oldest son, Manasseh. 
through searching the place and discovering this genealogical information, Lehi must have had confirmed what surely had been a family tradition over the years, his noble ancestry. So he is the descendant of Joseph through the son Manasseh. Chapter 5, verse 18, these plates of brass should go forth into all nations. Among Lehi's joyous prophecies was the full assurance that the plates of brass should never perish, neither should they be dimmed any more by time. From a very temporal perspective, perhaps Lehi was indicating here a neglect by Laban of the brass plates, a neglect which would have allowed the plates to become tarnished or corroded. Such would never again be see, be, be the case. Lehi predicted for thereafter they would receive the sacred attention so appropriate to such an infinitively invaluable scriptural and family record. From a more figurative perspective, the message on the brass plates is timeless, and thus the important matters contained therein would be untouched and undimmed. Indeed, truth, the sum of existence, will weather the worst, eternal and unchanged evermore. Lehi prophesied that these plates of brass should go forth into all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people who were of his seed. Since many of the precious truths of the brass plates were known and recorded by Book of Mormon prophets, writers, and writers, and since the book Book of Mormon prophet writers, I'm sorry. And since the Book of Mormon will eventually go to all the world as a witness of Jesus Christ and also the great Latter-day work, this particular prophetic interest is being and will be yet, and yet be fulfilled. In a dish, undoubtedly at some future day, the brass plates themselves will be brought forth and their contents thereafter will be available to study for all those with pure hearts and with And with ears to hear, that that is what that would be. So, with those who had clean hearts, <clears throat> and those who had and, and those with ears to hear. I apologize for the typo. Thank you for watching. There are great many passages in these first two chapters of the importance of Scripture, of prophets, of revelation, of Holy Ghost, and of faith, and continuing in that faith. And that having faith that whatever God commands us, He will provide a way for us to accomplish those things. That I know to be true. Again, thank you for watching. If you liked the presentation, hit the like button.